what I want to do today then, if there's no questions, is to continue and finish today with a discussion of health. And I'm going to do two things. First of all, I'm going to give an example of how to apply our analysis to an important problem. And, uh, and it, it leads to some interesting social and economic policy, eventually. And this is a flu pandemic. So we just went through a, a scare of, uh, of a, a pandemic. It didn't happen. Um, but uh, it may happen. Uh, and it, and, you know, the, the number of predictions of it happening, there have been some moderately serious flu epidemics in the world, but the really major one occurred in a hundred years ago, 1918-1919. And people estimate, it's a little difficult to estimate because you really want to look at how many more people died than what you would expect to have died given trends and so on. But, so you take that as you est the way you estimate, and that's how it's usually done, you find about 50 million people are estimated to have died from the flu pandemic of 1918-1919. Now that translates into about 165 million today. So I mean, that's a staggering number. It's 2.8% of the world's population. That's how I translated it. I took 2.8% of that 50 million was 2.8% of the population in 1918-1919, took the same 2.8% of today's 7 billion or so population and got around 168 million people, okay? So, now, what would be the cost of that? Well, what the Congressional Budget Office does in estimating what the cost of such a pandemic would be is they say, what would be the effect on GDP? Uh, if you had a pandemic that lasted for a couple of years of the severity of the 1918-1919 flu pandemic, and they estimate fairly significant effects on GDP. <clears throat> oh, I have the numbers with me. Um, well, if I don't, I'll make some numbers up. Uh, uh, I do. U.S. GDP would decline for one year by about 5%. So 5% of 13 trillion, uh, what is that? Um, 650 billion, is that it? Yeah, 650 billion. It's a lot of money. Oh, we blew more than that away on the stimulus package, but still it's a lot of money. Um, however, that's the wrong calculation. Why? Yeah? Because you're doing right now including the same percentage of the population with the wage today, you have to account the wage at that time. Or you are trying to... No, let's say, we assume that two, this is for the, the United States, let's say 2.8% of the U.S. population died today. today. Right? It may, you know, may be a different distribution, we may be less than the average, maybe in the poorer countries. That was also true then, but uh, that's not the main problem. Yes? I, I think the bigger problem is that um, that calculation takes the entire cost of the pandemic as the reduction in output, but people's lives are worth more than Yeah, I mean, we haven't, we've been talking all along about the value of life, the statistical value of life, right? And where does that come into that calculation? It doesn't. It comes into the effect of taking people away on GDP and, and, and not only deaths, but um, more, you know, morbidity, that is a bit bad health. Uh, but that's really a small part of the total cost. So how would we estimate the total cost? Well, the way we would do it would be, uh, let's say we had a statistical value of life um, at, for the United States, five million. Now, it's a little tricky because that will, should depend on the age distribution and so on. So I'm assuming it's young, mainly young people, which the flu we just passed was mainly hitting young adults. So for that flu, 1919, either hit very old or very young. But that wasn't the current flu. So it's not as bad. It would have been, it'd been a bad assumption for the 1918-19 flu. Not so bad now. 
Let's say we take it as five million. The, the exact number you'll see isn't so crucial. We, and then we make a corresponding assessment of the value of life in every other country as in proportion to the uh, ratio of their per capita GDP to the U.S. per capita GDP. So let's say a country with half the per capita GDP, we would have a value of life of two and a half million. <clears throat> India's like one eighth or one tenth would be one tenth of that. Okay? Reasonable. Uh, value of life theory says kind of move proportionally to GDP, right? Uh, and with homothetic pr production fund, clearly will. Um, then we assume it's some distribution across the world's population. I'm going to assume straight 2%, 2.8% 2 distribution. Now that's clearly not realistic. Uh, probably the rich countries will have better ways of protecting themselves than the poor countries, but that, that, let's take that number, 2.8%. So then what we have to add up, 2.8% of the population dying in each country, where we're valuing the life in each uh, country, of each person died by that uh, per capita income that we, we estimate off of the U.S. one in proportion. Okay? That's the calculation. You do that calculation, okay, so we, let me write down a few numbers. Ten what? A trillion. I didn't ten trillion. World GDP is probably something like forty trillion. So it's a multiple of world GDP. No, not it, it's not surprising. It's the value of life and so on. But it's, it, it, it's much more than world GDP, and much more than. Took 5% of world GDP, like in the U.S., you would estimate 5% of, let's say, 40 trillion is 2 trillion, right? We're getting 110 trillion. So that shows the difference in magnitude of the estimates. So the, the Congressional Budget Office <coughs> was estimating the wrong thing. I mean, it's useful to know the effect on GDP. All right. Now, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very large magnitude. So how much should we do to try to, you know, prevent that? Well, we have to know what the probabilities are. I made a simple calculation. Uh, I, we assume that there's a 1% <coughs> chance of pandemic in any year if none previously, okay? So it's not 1% each year. I mean, that would be too big an estimate, if, if none previously. So, and let's say the cost, C, that's the cost here, equals C, so C. So the first year, and we're looking at the uh, present value of that loss, first year would be 0 0.01 times C. That would be the loss in, uh, right? Because um, if you did it in terms of 0.99 chance, you have a regular world of, uh, uh, value, and then you, you have one 
a 1% chance of losing C, this would be the net loss. The second year, it would be, the, now you'd have to look at the conditional probability. 0.99 chance, you didn't have it the previous year. And so then, given that you didn't have it, the conditional probability is 0.01 C. We would discount that by 1 plus R. And we keep going like that. Simple calculation. I mean, make it more complicated. So you can see if we do that, we can factor out the 1.01 C. Then we have a geometric series, and we'd have 1 over approximately 1 minus 0.94. Right? I'm um, assuming. Let's say this is equal to 1.05, that 5% interest rate, 1.94. So we get 1.6 of C. So instead of uh, the discounted value, taking now account of the probability, is 1.6 of, of C. Now, you would, let's, uh, that would be what? 1.6 of C would be like um, almost 18 trillion or so, right? If, if our other estimate approximately 18 trillion. Tremendous number. Now you might say, well, 1% is too high. Suppose it was one uh, tenth of 1%. So you divide everything by one tenth, you still have almost $2 trillion for, for the world cost. And, and one in a thousand seems too low given that you've had major pandemics about every century. That's why I took 1%. One, uh, 1%. Uh, you can, and you can vary, uh, uh, vary with the uh, round. You're going to have a large number. Right? All right, so that, what does that mean? That means, you know, it's willing, uh, the world as a whole should be willing to spend a lot to try to head off a, a, such a pandemic. How? Well, developing, trying to develop vaccines, which we, we did rush to develop uh, flax vaccines for the swine flu. Turned out we didn't have the pandemic, but still it was precautionary uh, activity. So you develop a vaccine, uh, there is one. You have some program for uh, isolating people who contract the disease because a lot of the effect is contagion and, and, and things of that type. So it'd be willing, you, it should be willing to spend a lot on R&D and other things and stockpiling vaccines to, to prevent it. So I don't, I, if I look at what, what the world is spending, um, it, it, it's not a lot. Now, maybe the assumption is you can see, you begin to see a flu developing if the, the, the people in the Center for uh, Disease, <coughs> CD, Center for Disease, something in the U.S. who makes these estimates, estimates whether it's going to develop into a pandemic, and then you, you hope you have time to crank out enough vaccines. Uh, Time. But if this pandemic had spread quickly, we wouldn't have been able, the world wouldn't have been able to do it. Even at the rate at which it was spreading, most of the country, countries weren't prepared. All right. So, um, I, don't have, I don't have any strong lesson about this, other than that these pandemics, such a pandemic, is really costs a lot. And um, it may be worth putting a lot of resources in, individually and as, a, as countries, to try to protect yourself against the consequences of the pandemic. Okay? And we use, a, it's a good illustration of using the work on statistical value of life with a you know, bunch of other uh, things to try to estimate what the costs are. Okay? Any questions? Yeah? Um, it, don't we need to know the, the change in probability of a pandemic with particular sorts of interventions? Though? With what? Um, don't we need to know how effective the interventions that are available to us would have to be? Well, I'm, as, I'm assuming in this case we had no interventions. Right, this would be right. the so, cause. So if, okay. if you're saying should we spend Well, now we, of course, we'd have to know what the marginal the product reason, is of the, right. of the spending, right? But yeah. if, you take, if this number is at all reasonable, like 15, 10 trillion or so, right. it means um, you don't need a high marginal product to justify spending a lot Modern, right? Because you need to know if you had a zero marginal product, you wouldn't want to spend anything, even though you, you suffer this enormous loss, right? So, in, in doing that, in, in not in doing that calculation, we're going to the public policy question. Of course, you got to confront it with what can we do anything? If this is something you can't do anything, like hunting's and disease, genetically inherited disease that no known what, uh, 
a way of even uh, moderating its effects, nothing you can do about it. Uh, but uh, in these pandemics, that isn't the case generally. Uh, we can we do know about vaccines. We can stockpile them. You have to find the right vaccine. So you'd think it marginal product would actually be pretty high. Um, okay. Yeah. Now, for a while, we put uh, the U.S. and other countries discouraged a lot of vaccine makers because there were a lot of suits. People got sick from taking different types of vaccines and so on. So a lot of vaccine companies went out of business. The lawsuits were were too damaging. Um, so. That's something that one has to think about in terms of what, what optimal public policy is. Okay. Anything else? All right, so now let me go into something that I really haven't gone yet into on the health issue, still for continuing with health. We Remember we... Uh, when we were discussing investments in education, we said there were a lot of uh, uh, complementarities between, let's say, earlier investments and later investments. For example, investments in cognitive skills, investments in non-cognitive skills, uh, investments in childhood, investments in adulthood, and the like. Uh, uh, technically, they don't have to be complements, but there's uh, good reasons why you'd expect them to be complements. And with health, there are also very strong complementarities. The health area is really dominated by a lot of complementarities. Um, so if I thought I would be having a high, things we'll be able to show very easily. If, the, if my probability of surviving at later ages was higher, my incentive to invest in reducing my probability of surviving at earlier ages goes up. So in that case, it would be a complementarity between higher survival in earlier ages and, act, and acti act activities that raise, I'm sorry, higher survival at later ages and activities that raises your uh, uh, investments that raise your survival at earlier ages. That would be one type of complementarity. Another type would be given that there's greater survival at earlier ages, in some sense, and I'll have to make that this more rigorous, there's greater incentive to invest in resources that increase your survival at later ages. Right. Uh, now, you can see one clear reason if there are more people surviving to later ages, then there's more incentive to invest in R&D. So more people are surviving to old age, and more incentive to invest in can cancer cures and cardiovascular treatments and Alzheimer's and things of that type. In a world where nobody gets to be over 65 pretty much, you don't worry about those diseases. So poorer countries don't worry about those diseases. Poorer countries are worrying about infectious diseases, tuberculosis, you know, infant mortality, all those diseases of, of young age. That's where their, their big issue is. Not at old age. Rich countries are worried about old age diseases, middle to old age diseases. That's where it goes in various cancers and the like. Now, why is that? Well, we can give you the, uh, I'll be able to give you the, why that's rational, at both at an individual level and at a group, and at an investment level, private or public. Okay? So to do that, we need to go to more than two years. So let's say there are three years. Okay. We could do two years if the probability of surviving in the first year wasn't certain, but since we've been assuming it's certain to survive the first year, let's go to three years. Okay.
of surviving year two. By conditional, I mean conditional on surviving year one. So given that you reach age one, what's your likelihood that you'll survive through age two? And S3 is the conditional probability of surviving to end of year three. And then you die at, at, at that point with certainty. I mean, we can keep going on, you know, and you can go on infant to infinitely long. You can see you're taking the product of numbers that are less than one, so the product is generally going to get small at, at, at later ages. So you don't have to assume there's any any limits to life. Um, the effective limits come out of this analysis. Right. And then we can call SI is the unconditional, unconditional probability of surviving to age I. So then we have this simple relation, SI <coughs> is equal S1 times S2 times S, let's make sure to get the time units right, S2 times um, SI, okay? That's just a product. So I'm looking from the point from now, if I is 1, my unconditional probability of surviving age 1 is simply little s1. If I'm thinking now what my unconditional probability of surviving uh, through age 2, well, first of all, I have to get through age 1 in order to be able to survive through age 2, so that's s1, and I have to time by my likelihood of getting through age 2, and then keep going. So this would be a general formula. Right, that we hold for any number of years. We're only going to have three uh, to start with. And, uh, uh, okay. So, so then it's easy to write down now the generalized utility function compared to what we had earlier. We would say that V is equal to S1 times u of x1 l1 plus beta times s2 u of l2 x2 l2 plus beta squared times s3 times u of x3 l3, right? Where we, we know yeah, I mean, we're going to generally assume that S1 equals S1 is equal to 1. We don't have to assume that, but we'll assume that, okay? So you're going to survive the first year with certainty. And it's the unconditional probabilities that enter into the utility function. That's what you have to recognize. It's the unconditional probability. As of now, I mean, next year... Uh, I'll do things as of next year, right? But we're going to have time consistency. So I can look, look upon making all my decisions as of now, right? I mean, that's, you know, if you have time consistency, you can convert that into that problem. And I'm going to take even a simple version of that where all the action in terms of health is done in the first period only. But that's, you know, I mean, that's just to simplify the presentation. Um, I'll discuss some uh, generalizations of that. So any questions until now? Okay? All right. So then, we can... on health goods 
H. And the question is, how does G of H, how does H, G of H is the expenditures. It's now come into the budget constraint. I'm going to assume these expenditures occur in the first period. And they can influence um, all, all the conditional probabilities. But let's start out simply, they only influence the probability of surviving through the second period. Probably the first period I'm going to survive with certainty. Okay? So I spend now in the first period, and I'm going to survive with certainty to raise my probability of surviving in the second period. Okay? So we're going to make S2, therefore S2 is some function of H with ds2 little s dh greater than or equal to zero and the second derivative we get diminishing returns in the expenditure right? now it's possible and indeed likely that even though I'm spending all everything today, it may well be true and likely that S3 is also a function of H. So what I spend in childhood, period one, may also affect my conditional probability of surviving, not only next period, but also periods after that and so on. <coughs> and this has long-term effects. Uh, and there are examples of uh, where you see long-term effects for what happened in in early childhood, not so much of, of expenditures, uh, but early childhood. Take them back to this uh, influential pa uh, pandemic, 1918-1919, what somebody has done something very clever. Uh, they looked at children who were born in the period 1918 or 1919, and looked at their life mortality rates at various ages in the future. And who did they compare it with? They compared it with the children who were born just before the pandemic started and just after. So kind of a, it seemed like a natural control group, right? Uh, the one difference, major difference being, not only, but may, and, you know, they tried to control the inc a few income there, but they were mine because you're comparing adjacent periods. Like, you know, people often compare when you have uh, like cutoff points to, to qualify for uh, a, some kind of subsidy looking at people just below the cutoff and just at it or above, and they're, they're pretty good control groups. So people did that with the, in the flu pandemic, and what they found was, yes, the probability of surviving uh, birth and so on was lower for the people born during the pandemic. No surprises there, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of disease around. Uh, but they had a lower survival probabilities, conditional probabilities at, at all later ages. And they, and they were following us, since this was 1918, 19, you can follow them for 60, uh, for 80 years. I mean, so pretty much most of those people have died already, and people before and after. And they had lower survival probabilities at every age. So what, happened, and what does this demonstrate? Something that's being increasingly recognized in the health and, and health economics literature, but general health literature, that what happens at, in very, very early on in childhood can have cast a long shadow in terms of your health at all later ages. All right, not simply in the unconditional probability, that's obvious, but in the conditional probability, much less obvious that there should have been any effect there. In fact, you could give arguments the other way. Why? How could you give arguments the other way? You're well, because of like the, so, you know, if, if the weak, weak die off earlier, yeah. then the weak Right, yeah, the, the strong, early. only the strong survive, right? So you they might have better, but it turns out, yes, it's probably an effect in that direction, but it's more dominated by this other effect. So it has to offset that effect, be strong enough to offset that effect. So it's kind of interesting. And there's other evidence that early childhood can have effects. Um, okay, we do know that diseases in childhood carry long-term uh, consequences. I mean, in the childhood diseases we used to have uh, are gone now, but you know, I had diphtheria and scarlet fever, two really serious diseases, so it should have cut down my life expectancy a lot. Maybe it will at some point. <laughs>
Uh, are, are they able to uh, tease out? I mean, you could you could make an argument that I was born during the flu pandemic and just biologically, you know, developmentally or something, my biology is different than somebody else, and because of that, at every period, I'm, I have a conditionally lower uh, life expectancy. But it may also be that, you know. My father died during the flu pandemic, and because of that, I never achieved, you know, certain levels of education that my counterparts who were born. Well, but people control for education. He control for education. That you can control for. Maybe some unobservables. You know, you or just, just, just control. You control for a lot of other variables. Yeah. You can do that. That you can do because you'll, you'll, you'll have this by education, by other characteristics. And I don't know what the results are. Whether the education of the people during that in that period. I would predict they probably had less education, but it's not clear where the causation is going from, right? Because I grew up in a family where I, maybe I had, I had only one parent, or because I wasn't as healthy. I didn't, I mean, it's an old issue of whether it's health is causing education, education is causing health. So my guess would be you do find an education effect, but with what's causing it, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't venture it offhand. Okay? Anything else? In the value of stati the statistical value of life, we don't take this into account. Right? That what I mean, this? the idea that in the future the, the children who had the who were affected by the flu uh, would would have lower incomes later on because yeah, no, it, it, it's, in statistical value of life estimates, it's a good question. Let me go ahead and answer that. Uh, usually, there's no adjustment for the fact that, forget the flu for the moment, in general, if I die, uh, what's my loss? My loss is, say, my command over goods and services, but also <coughs> the loss of not seeing you, you, your wife or your children, your grandchildren, and so on. Right? That could be significant. With altruism, you know, we have a lot of models of altruism. Those are not usually uh, incorporated. So, uh, in, in, in the uh, let me be a little bit careful now. Okay. It's always pays to be a little bit careful. All right. Uh, in my in, intu, intu, intuition that I gave you about what merit, what determines the statistical value of life in terms of full income adjusted, I don't take that into account. Presumably, people in their decision, if we're estimating the statistical value of life and actual choices that you make, of course they're taking <coughs> that into account. Right. right. They are taking that into right. account. Uh, so. The, my calculation should be an underestimate of what, if they're putting a good value on that, of what they're doing. Right. You know, not, numbers aren't precise enough. I mean, so one could say, is it an underestimate or not? But in principle, yes, people should be taking that into account. So one reason maybe why all the people put a high value on their life, even though they have a lot of years to leave, is they're losing a lot in terms of the utility they're getting from, you know, living and uh, mixing up with people, uh, and they may be getting a lot of utility that they're giving up. And they're going to this unknown where, you know, who knows what utility they get, right? Anything else? And, you know, it, and it could also be that early uh, investments here, it could be that this too is positive. Could be. That it, it invests your survival effect directly affects your conditional uh, probability. Okay, uh, and I'll, I'll talk, touch on that a little bit, and mainly ignore that because we can get complementarity even without that. That doesn't mean it isn't important. Now, note again what we saw before, and I, I don't have to emphasize a lot that the 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 utility function here. You can see that the advantage of increasing S, and I'll work to show you explicitly, is going to depend on utility levels. Just like in any self-protection problem, we saw that for two periods, so it extends in general. That's in general. True. Okay? So that's what we should expect. If we look at the marginal benefit of spending more on H, we should say that's a function of utility levels in each period. Okay? Not marginal utility. I mean, marginal utilities in terms of opportunity cost of the uh, a money spent, yes, that will enter. But in terms of the benefit, that's a cost. In terms of the benefits, it will be utility levels, okay? 
Now, in order to work that out, we have to know what the budget constraint is. So we're going to take generalize the budget constraint we have for two periods, assume full insurance or full, full annuities, full and fair annuities. So the present, <coughs> the discounted value of expected consumption, expectations taken over the survival probabilities is equal to the discounted value of expected earnings. Okay. So, what would we have? We would have x1 plus s2 times x2. I'm, I'm assuming all the prices of the goods are equal to 1, so uh, over 1 plus r plus s3 x3 over 1 plus r squared plus g of h. So assume all the expenditures taking place now in the present. And that's going to be equal, well, W1 times 1 minus L1, that's earnings, plus or S1, W1. Yeah, put S1 here. S1 plus S2, W2 times 1 minus L1, or 1 plus R. Plus S3, W3, and 1 minus L2, now here L3, over 1 plus R squared. All right? That's my budget constraint. If I had some health expenditure occurring conditionally in period 2, then I can put that as occurring in period 2, conditional on my region period 2. So then what I'm going to maximize is that utility function subject to this budget constraint. And you'll see that the first order, and if we look at the first order conditions, for Xi and Li, uh, the Si's drop out. So that's what full insurance does for you. It drops out now. So you, uh, if you look at the, uh, you know, just going to have uh, uh, it, as if there was certainty, the margin utility of, of, uh, of additional unit of x uh, in period two is going to be equal to uh, the, the discounted value of that is going to be equal to lambda over the interest rate and so on. Okay, same as before. So I'm not going to write those down unless anybody has any questions. Any questions about that? No. Okay. All right. So now. Uh, we want to look at the uh, first order condition for spending on health. Okay. differentiation. Uh, all right, so where's the, here's, the, here's the utility function. So if we spend more on health, what would be the marginal? Well, S1 is assumed to be 1, so we don't have to worry about that. We'd have beta times uh, ds2 dh times u2 plus beta squared times ds2 3 dh u3, right? Okay, now, if you look at the budget constraint, that's going to be equal to lambda times what? g prime of h, that's the basic cost. And then we have these other terms um, plus.
I'm not going to say a lot about these two terms here, but I, I went through the analysis, what they mean before. I'm not going to say a lot about them. Okay, but let's look at this. So if we just neglect these for now, but neglect these, basically. We have the marginal cost converted into utility units, okay, by lambda. So lambda, we know from the first order condition for the x would be u prime of x1, or u of x1, okay? It's a marginal utility consumption in the first period, okay? Uh, what is ds2gh? Well, uh, we know that s2 is equal to s2 times s is equal to S2 times S1. S1 is 1, so it's basically just equal to S2, and therefore ds2 dh is simply ds2 dh, okay? So we can, let's substitute that in here now. We have little s2. Condition, conditional probability. Uh, S3, S3, is equal to S2 times S3. H doesn't, let's say, take the simple case, H doesn't affect S3, okay? So what is DS3, DS2? Well, it's DS2, DH times S3. So now we can put here DS2, DH times S3, okay? So this is the marginal benefit. This is the marginal cost. Okay, so most of it is just kind of straightforward. What's interesting about this? Well, what's interesting is a couple of things. One, it's utility levels. These are utility levels that we know, but I want to emphasize that again because that's important. Uh, okay. And so, if we divide it through by, if we divide it through by lambda, we would have this equal <coughs> u x1 and u x1. And under some conditions, with the discount rate equal to the rate of interest, uh, 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 time preference equal to the rate of interest, uh, we saw before this would simply be the ratio utility level to marginal utility in a comparable period. Right. More generally, it's a little more complicated than that. But th these are the value of life terms that we have. Now, well, we have more than one period. We're going to be summing up the discounted value of these over many periods. So it's just a simple generalization of what we had before from this point of view. But it's good to recognize that. So when I say the value of life for a young person is 5 million, we're discounting all those terms up. The question is, what are we discounting? Now here, what's interesting is, when we take uh, effects on health that raises our probability of surviving period two, that clearly raises the value of the utility, discounted value of the utility in period two, but it also raises discounted value of the utility in period three, right? Because the Discounted value of the utility in period three depends on the unconditional survival probability. And that depends on a series of conditional probabilities. So if I do something now that raises my conditional probability of surviving in early years, that's going to affect my discounted value of the utility I get from period three and all subsequent years. Okay. That's important to note. Simply arithmetic, uh, you know, <laughs> what survival rates mean, plus combined with an assumption, which makes it even hard, you know, makes it even starker, that all, the expenditures in health is only affecting my probability of surviving in period two. It's not directly affecting any other conditional probability of surviving. And if I affected all of them, then of course it would be obvious you did the effects on everything. But it's only affecting it in this one period, but because that then affects everything else, uh, you, that enters into your value of um, taking health care. So you can see from this immediately that <coughs> why it's more valuable 
other things are saying to take, spend on health that raises your probability of surviving younger ages. I mean, that's, that's important. Because that's going to help you at every other later age. If all I'm doing is raising my probability of surviving at age 90, I'm taking actions now that raise my probability of surviving at age 90, what does it do for me in all these other years? It doesn't do anything for me. <coughs> okay? So we're going to use that later on to explain some important observations. But you have to understand what's going on. Okay? Do you understand it? Pietro Baroli. Why is it happening? Sorry, why is it happening? Uh, why, <coughs> by taking actions on my health that affects my conditional probability of surviving at period two, why does it have all long-term consequences for my whole life cycle? Because uh, the unconditional probability is the product of all the conditional ones, okay. and so S2 will be will appear in all the future utilities. And so I'm picking up all the You're picking up all those utilities absolutely. in the future. That's exactly what's going on. Okay. If I also by taking H affected the conditional probability in period three, I'd have to add another term. And then I'd have to add S2 times DS3. But even without that, I'm getting this effect. So that's one important thing to recognize. The other important thing to recognize here is that my incentive to improve my health in period two depends also on my likelihood of surviving through period three. If I'm sure I'm not going to make it through period three, I have less incentive to get through period two. And from an equation point of view, it shows up that S3, the size of S3 is here. Even though S3 isn't affected by my assumption, but what I'm doing to improve my health, an increase in S3 does raise my benefit from taking actions that raise my probability. Okay? So if I'm in an environment where it's very likely I'm, I'm going to die early, this will reduce my incentive to lower my probability of dying early. I mean, in a well-defined sense, right? So if age is hitting me, if people between ages 25 and 45, then the incentive to survive to age 25 goes down. Okay. To survive to that age goes down. That's what we're saying. Right? So there's a complementarity between what I'll be doing later on and what I want to do now. What's happening to me later on? Maybe I'm not doing anything. It's just happening. What's happening to me later on? Okay. Follow that? Okay, so... <clears throat> what is it... So what it says is other things are saying what's, it's rational. Let's say I have a given amount to spend on health. It's rational to first to spend it first on raising my probability of surviving early ages. Now I say other things are saying maybe. I'm more productive raising it at a later age, so I gotta take that into account. Now. <coughs> okay, but there's an important sense in which it's rational to go first for the early ages, okay. and then only then, as you improve those, you go for the later ages. So, so we get an implication out of what's rational there. We, we'll be able to check that at least in a broad sweep of data to see if, if, if the way health has changed over time is consistent with this, this implication, a very simple rational view. And I said, of course, it may be an additional effect 
that encourages you to spend at early ages, namely that it raises your, by raising your conditional probability of surviving early ages, you also raise your conditional probability of surviving later ages. Could be. I'm not assuming that. Yeah. Just to simplify it, not really right off of that effect, that effect could be operating as well. That would just strengthen the effect that I'm discussing. show the special importance of early childhood investments and survival. Okay. And, um, and it's, 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 it's a, just an implication of demographic theory in a very simple form of what uh, the difference between conditional and unconditional probability of surviving to different ages. Okay. So that's an important demographic principle that shows up in a lot of problems in demographic theory. But it, it has a lot of implications, but one simple implication is if we look at it from the point of view of not simply demography, looking at how age distributions change and so on in some mechanical way, which can be useful, but asking how people's choice sets are affected, how their choices are affected, then we use that property to understand their choices. And that's the difference between economic demography and pure demography. We bring in behavior um, as opposed to just the demographic aspect, which could also could be important, but they're not enough to understand a lot of a lot of choices, and that's what economists have to contribute: is uh, theory of choice. Okay. So, you know, more generally, we would write. So, I've been assuming three periods, of course. More generally, the marginal benefit, this term over there, marginal benefit, would, would be equal to the sum of bi if it only affects this. go to infinity if these S's are many of them let's say significantly less than one then the product of them as you go over many years is going to be very close to zero so in terms of expectation the likelihood you'll survive to 150 years is very tiny <laughs> now on the other hand if we could raise all these survival conditional probabilities of surviving to very high numbers, then uh, then you can get a lot more people in. So when people have said in the past that well, you, biologically you couldn't live beyond 150, what they meant was not that there was some biological impossibility uh, that wasn't true, but uh, that the probabilities became really tiny because uh, the conditional probability of surviving each of these ages became sm were small, so you make the product of all of them over 100 years, it, it's a really tiny number. That's what was meant. And that view has been changing, because now it doesn't look like these conditional probabilities of surviving uh, are so low, low, it requires a lot of you know, medical intervention to, that, uh, to make them not so low. That's what the modern modern medicine has, has enabled us to do. Now if you look at that general formula, you could see this effect operates in every period. You can factor it out even, and it'll operate in every period except the first period. Um, and you can see how, if, if, if you compare them, that's, that's marginal benefit of, uh, let's say, of S2. If you had a marginal benefit of Sn, that would only be, if that, is, that is, if you're only affecting the, um, yeah, uh, 
if you're only affecting the probability of surviving at age N, then that doesn't affect any of the probabilities. If that's all you're doing, that doesn't affect any of the probability of surviving at earlier ages, right? And so then you'd have to start all this at age N, and you'd have B, J, D, S, N, D, H, some H. I'll do that H, H2, H of N. Uh, and I have S, N plus 1, and so on. U, J. And then J would run from, let's say, um, N to infinity. And so that's going to be, you know, assuming these effects are comparable magnitude, this is going to be, if N is a lot bigger than 2, it's going to be a lot smaller magnitude in general, right? You're discounting it by beta, and so you're only starting with the high beta, beta to raised to high power, and you're chopping off, you're truncating off all the earlier periods. Okay? So that shows the advantage of, of spending at earlier ages to raise your health. Okay? Um, and there will be little incentive to, if there may be little incentive to raise, you know, SN. Because if I look at the discounted utility of this, and this is all I'm doing, and I'm So if this is all I'm doing, then I'm losing, you know, I'm not get, picking up any benefits early. So I'm only doing things at age 65, I'm discounting that, like beta to the 65th power. Beta may be 0.99, but beta to the 65th power is going to be a pretty small number, right? So on the other hand, if I affect the very early ones, I pick up all over all utility periods. Now, if these future S's were really small, it's going to also lower my effect, but I'm picking up over all the periods. That's the difference. Yes? If the unconditional probability of surviving increases, could we have moral hazard problems? What? Moral hazard problems, like not reducing the incentives to invest in health? It's like I'm thinking... Remember, I have fair, fair annuities. So by fair annuities, it means so whatever your incentives, whatever your incentives to invest that affect your probability of surviving are, the insurance company will take that into account in the price they charge you for this annuity insurance. So if you're goofing off and not changing your survival rates, right, and you're, uh, uh, they may give it to you uh, uh, pretty cheaply, right, because you're going to die quickly. On the other hand, if you're working really hard um, and you're going to survive a lot, they'll take that into account what they offer you because your S's are going to be high and you're going to have to pay more for that. So Thomas Phillips and I have a paper published in the, in the JP a few years ago when we said, we argued, we argued a moral hazard argument. We said, well, if people are on Social Security where they're getting a fixed amount per year, let's say in every country, <coughs> or some other pension plan, it doesn't have to be Social Security, fixed amount per year, but take Social Security, then they have an incentive to kind of work hard to keep themselves living longer because they automatically pick up the Social Security benefit, right? That's a moral hazard question. Now, if the, if the Social Security was an, uh, rated by my probabilities of surviving, uh, then that would offset that. But if it's not rated, if I'm just going to get an automatically a certain amount independently of what my probabilities are, I'll work harder to make my probabilities higher. Right. So the logic is right. We, we had a little evidence suggesting maybe there was something to it, but the logic is clearly right. That is the moral hazard argument when you look at annuities, like Social Security. Okay. Yes? If there's a high child mortality, like for example S3 is very small, does it make sense to invest only from 4 onwards, so to speak? Or like, 
Because that's that's investment held. Like yeah. focus investment in held only after. It so might. I might. Uh, let's suppose. It might be more extreme. Supposing S two is very small. All right. I know I'm going to get through period one. But S2 is very small. I can't do much to affect S2, but I can do a lot to affect S3. And I'll skip doing anything on S2. If I don't make it through, I don't do I'm assuming I do on S3 later on, not now. Yeah. See, the way I formulate, I'm doing everything now. But if, I, uh, if I'm doing, if, uh, that's okay. I mean, it still could make a difference. But it, it, be, it's darker if, let's say, I'm, I'll invest in S3 if I get to period 3. Then I'll wait. In that case, I will wait. I won't invest. Right? On the other hand, if I can do a lot, either now or later, I prefer to do it now. <clears throat> Good, I might do both. Right? If I can raise my probability of surviving to young age, at young ages, that's great. Because that's going to help me at every age. Unconditionally. It's going to help me at every age. If I just raise my probability of surviving starting at age 65, let's say, that's not going to help me until I get to 65. Right? Yeah. Not going to help me. But so, I was thinking that in some developing countries, it looks like the value of life of young children is, uh, <coughs> I mean, the investment in young children is very little, and they wait basically until four or five years before investing in the children because there's a high child mortality, and so some of this investment might be lost. Yeah. Well, you know, value of lives are not necessarily monotonically fall, uh, falling with age. Um, he, he, aside from just uh, um, purely you know, uh, discounting type of consideration, you look at the stuff in Murphy and Topel, it's not, it's not monotonic. Uh, uh, but aside from that, uh, it, it may be, if you, you feel you can't do anything in childhood to raise the probability of surviving childhood, suppose you feel you can't do anything there, and then you say, well, I'll concentrate on later ages. My kids don't make it to that age, I'll be very upset, but there's nothing I can do about it. In fact, that's not what goes on in less developed countries. The biggest progress has been at the very early ages. I'll come to a little data on that in a moment. Okay. Of the probably the greatest achievement in health worldwide. I remember uh, uh, I posed a question to a group uh, at a party that we were giving New Year's Eve to that year at the beginning of this century. What was the greatest achievement of the 19th of the 20th century? And some people said the computer. Uh, some people said uh, democracy. And, uh, and you know, those might be right. Uh, but I said, no, they're all wrong. <laughs> it was the improvement in life expectancy. Um, uh, now, uh, who, who knows what the right answer? There are a lot of important improvements. But that effect was enormous was enormous. I mean, the life expectancy in rich countries at birth went from like 45 to over 80. That's from the beginning of, 19, of, of, of the year uh, 1900 um, to uh, 2000. And developed countries, undeveloped countries, went up by an even bigger percentage. So you try to calculate, and people have tried to calculate that. People have shown that if you adjust for the improvements in health, only on the mortality improvements, and you put it on an annual basis, and, and you say, what consumption equivalent is it? It's the equivalent of doubling the rate of growth in consumption over the 20th century of the, of the United States. We have done that. Nordhaus did that for the United States. Doubled the rate of growth. So it was an enormous effect. I mean, to double the rate of growth is, is a tremendous achievement. Now it's achieved for, for 100 years. So the effect on, on health, whether it's the most important gain of the 20th century, one can argue, but it surely would rank up among the most important gains. Now, of course, you want to subtract out all the medical exp spending and so on to get a net effect. On it, which he did, and it's still very large. <coughs> and that's true for developing countries in the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, Phillips and I did a calculation, and, uh, and uh, Rodrigo Suarez, 
if we add to the growth in per capita income of the world, different countries of the world since 1960, add to that the value of life measures of the decline in mortality, and look at the growth in what we call full income, that raised the growth rate substantially, but we were concentrating on another issue. Uh, what happened to world inequality in full income as opposed to regular income. You look at the growth in regular income, it was about on the average the same in poor countries as rich countries from 1960. No convergence. <clears throat> a little bit when you're weighed by, toward the end by China and India, but overall very, very little convergence. But if you, if, you do, if you look at full income growth, taking account of the improvement in mortality, it was greater for the poorer countries than for rich countries, and you got a narrowing of inequality, in per capita inequality, in full income. Uh, oh, that's important, but uh, now I want to stress an, a different point. So here we're beginning of the, of the 20th century, okay? Beginning of the 20th century. Where are we going to put our, our money? Okay? Well, this theory says you put your money on reducing early mortality. <coughs> both at an individual level and at a public health, public expenditure level. You put it on reducing early mortality. Where did the change occur? Early childhood. And not real early only, but here, I have, a, I have some data, okay, for the United States. It's very similar to most other countries, in other countries. Here's for the United States. So life expectancy at birth, at, at birth, at age 45 and age 65, <coughs> by decades from 1900, okay? And you can see uh, life expectancy at age 45 did not change very much, or at age 65 did not change very much for either males or females until about 1950. That didn't improve much. If you reach those ages, you weren't much better off in terms of your life expectancy then than you were in 1900. On the other hand, life expectancy at birth improved a lot in the first 50 years. Okay. Child mortality went down, young adult mortality went down, childhood mortality went down, and they went down by a lot. So th those effects uh, were growing very rapidly in the first 50 years. Okay. Well, that's what we would predict, right? That's where they should be growing most rapidly. Mortality rates were pretty high in early in, in childhood. Uh, then, by improving those, you improve your unconditional probability of surviving at all ages. You work then. You don't work on cancers. 1900, they weren't working on cancer or cardiovascular diseases. We were no better off then than we were in 1800 or 1940. We were very little better off. Alzheimer's, they didn't even identify that as a disease at that time. Where was the work going? Reducing child mortality, reducing tuberculosis, diseases of the young, reducing a variety of other diseases of the young. That improved a lot. By the time 1950 came along, really few people were dying now in the first 40 or 50 years. Okay, so the yeses were getting up there pretty close to one. So, then there was a big incentive to begin to switch. So then if you look at life expectancy in starting in 1950, let's say at 1950, life expectancy at say age 45 or age 65 began then to increase by increasing amounts. So it's flat. So if you look at, if you look at this, Graph looks something like this. Birth. I have a second year birth. Say right here, 45 <coughs> or so. Here, maybe 85. Okay. Here, about 19. 
Now if we look at life expectancy at age 45, well, it's 30 years, so it's like this. Sixty-five, it's somewhat similar, lower, right? Lower than life expectancy at age 45. Anybody question that? Stuff like that. Sixty-five. Okay. Um, so our explanation, it would be, well, that's rational. It's rational in two senses. For an individual, that's how they would like to do their own investments. Or their children, right? You concentrate on the early childhood diseases. Uh, for the children, for yourself, and, and as you get to be an adult, your early diseases. Um, for society, you do the same in terms of R&D, medical attention. Uh, so now, uh, for society, you can say there were two reasons why initially they would concentrate on early diseases. One, because it has this cumulative effect on all the other, I mean, continuing effect on all the other ages. And two, in the early part of the 20th century, not many people were reached age 65. Uh, so poorer countries, Somebody mentioned who raised the issue about poor countries. You did, Viroli, right? Yeah. About poor countries. They don't care about very much about cancers and so on. You look at their improvements. You look at the improvements in poorer countries. Uh, in the data I mentioned that uh, Phelps and Suarez and I put together, you look at their improvement. It was mainly in improvements in diseases of younger ages, infectious diseases, uh, tuberculosis and things like that. It was not improvements. <coughs> In fact, they fell behind a little bit in cardiovascular diseases. It wasn't so important for them. All right? The technology they wanted that was important was for young ones. The U for developed countries, just, just the opposite. Okay? Now, there's reason to put more of the investment, both, say, drug companies and individuals at older ages. For a drug company, there are a lot more people at older ages. So if I can come up with a good drug that reduces blood pressure, right? that can help you with uh, breast cancer, or prostate cancer. I, there's a, a lot of money to be made in that. Because there are a lot of people who, who, who are vulnerable to that disease. There weren't many in 1900. Now, it's partly there's more people in the world, but <coughs> also the age distribution has heavily shifted toward the older ages. Okay? And so you see the drug companies are changing what they're doing. They have been changing. A lot of their efforts now are made up Almost all their efforts are made on diseases of older ages. That's where the money is. And same thing for society. What drug companies are doing are socially optimal in, in this regard. That's what society is doing. That's where we're putting the, the resource, every country that has this, this situation. That's where we're putting the money. Okay? So it is right. This theory, simple as it is, is predictions that really have, I think, important implications as we look at the cost of uh, improvements in life expectancy throughout the 20th century, and I think continuing now into the 21st century. So any questions? Yeah? I'm wondering, um, in your opinion, what, you know, as, as this is nothing rules in terms of things like cures for cancer, especially like in middle income countries where the life expectancy will be improving, the demand will be growing as well. Um, if, if the investment in, in, in things like this um, what the effect of it will be on, say, child mortality. I mean, one theory from what you said seems to suggest that higher life expectancy will increase the incentive to invest in early on stages and thus decrease child mortality. So, cure cancer. Increases I'm not quite sure. Uh, let's go rates. back a little. What, what What's the question you're asking? Is Is what the overall what we would expect overall the effects to be of, of some of the cure for cancer on something like you know, mortality? I mean, in terms of investment in reducing infant mortality? Right. Well, if you, uh, we, you, we can answer that question with our analysis. What's the answer? Well, see, there's, there's two answers, though, it seems. I mean, one well, let's give me the correct one. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah, what are your two answers? <laughs> Also decrease 
levels of child mortality at earlier ages. Give you an incentive. If you had a higher probability of surviving later ages, you have a higher incentive to invest in, re in raising your probability of surviving at an early age. It may be small because it's very discounted, but you would have that incentive. Yes. What's the other force? You say there are two different forces. Well, right. I mean, that, that, that first force is, you know, obviously there's a higher incentive to invest in it, but then there's also the direct trade off of using resources that you could be using now. It's a budget concern. It's using resources that you could be using now to decrease infant mortality on curing cancer. Well, you may want to be doing both. You don't have a fixed amount you're spending on, on health. I mean, don't, we, don't we, though? I mean, well, well, do we? Let me give you some simple data. How much, what fraction of U.S. GDP do we spend on health in 1900? Less you, than you don't know that fact? Less than we do now. <laughs> Not less than we do now, a lot less than we do now. A lot less. Probably of the order, I mean, I don't know the answer to it either. But <laughs> I'm going to guess that it's about 3%. No more than 3%. And I'll bet on that's pretty close. We're spending now 16% of a much larger income. A much larger fraction of a much larger income. So there's no simple budget constraint. I mean, if you know, you're doing both at the margin. If, the, if you increase, if you have a breakthrough in cancer, you increase the probability of survival, maybe by spending some money. You do that. You have a breakthrough. You're definitely going to increase the incentive to invest in early childhood. And you'll take, yes, resources are overall are constrained. You'll take resources away from other things because it's more important to invest in, in this life expectancy than maybe in other consumption goods. Or leisure. So that's what will happen. Okay, and the theory gives you a pretty cl uh, clean answer about that. Okay. So that's a good question. I'm only joking. It's a good. I mean, it is a good question. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions? Yeah. What do you think in in terms of like the developing nations? What if you know, like in terms, if there's a health shock such as AIDS that affects middle age and later ages, what do you think is going to be optimal for that country? Should they invest? Because, I mean, they still have the problems of early ages, you know, trying to mitigate infant mortality, but at the same time, there's a considerable amount of the population that's dying off because of age. You know, in that case, they have to sort of find an optimal balance between... Yeah. Well, what, I mean, if, let's say, take for the moment the incidence of ages, age is given. Okay, and I'll come back to that. Uh, They'll have less incentive to invest in the early childhood uh, reduction because, from the same result, if, you know, a lot of people are going to be dying off between ages 20 and 40. You don't have much as much incentive to get them to age 20 as you did before, mm -hmm. so you have less incentive. On the other hand, there maybe there's a big payoff to investing in reducing age, right? Uh, and one of the problems with some of the high age countries initially they denied it was a problem. But it is a problem, and we, there are methods now to reduce that probability. There, you know, there are first of all contraception, it, you know, use, use of contraception, a really cheap method of greatly reducing that probability. There's an expensive method in terms of drug uh, cocktails and so on. So, if I'm in a country like that, and I'm giving advice to what public policy should be. I would say, uh, before I start cutting my expenditures on health in these early ages, let me take some steps that will raise the prob uh, lower the probability by a lot of, of having AIDS. And it's a challenge, but it, it could be done. And some of them are expensive, some of them are cheap. And the cheaper ones you definitely want to do, the expensive ones you have to make the calculation. So that's how I would approach it. But if you take the AIDS probabilities as given, yes, you do reduce the incentive to invest, just like you reduce the incentive to invest in education. As I mentioned be previously, one of my lectures, so a few studies show there wasn't, had been a reduced incentive to invest in education in the high age, country, age countries. So, so the most efficient thing to do would be to hold the investment on early childhood health <coughs> constant and attack the AIDS problem. Yeah, there. maybe lower that investment a little, but mainly attack the AIDS problem. Okay. Yeah. All right, so no other questions? We'll, we'll meet on Thursday.